Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm DJ Patil and former U.S. Uh, chief data scientist under President Obama and a member of the Commonwealth Board of, of Governors and your moderator for today's program. The Commonwealth Club has, of course, shifted from in-person events to virtual events, and we are grateful for all of your support as viewers and listeners. I would ask you if you're if you're excited about these kind of programs, please consider donating to the club. And if you wish to do so, please click on the blue donate button at the top of the YouTube chat box or visit the Commonwealth Club's website at commonwealthclub.org. You can also follow us on social media at Inforum SF and at Commonwealth Club uh, at CW Club uh, uh, on uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, we also want to remind you to submit your questions via the chat room next to your screen, and I will try to get to as many as of them as possible later in the program. And now it is my incredible pleasure to introduce you to our guest and, and a very close dear friend of mine, uh, Sunil Gupta, who is an entrepreneur. He holds a JD and MBA. He's been a lecturer or is a lecturer currently uh, on innovation at Harvard University, an author of a new book, really, which I think is one of the great books that I wish I had <laughs> so many years ago, Backable, The Surprising Truth Behind What Makes People Take a Chance on You. Uh, Sunil argues more than ever that it's important to be backable, to get the support we need to re-enter the workforce, changing life direction after quarantine, and navigating very different social scenes. He comes from a family of highly backable people, including his mother, uh, just a phenomenal woman, and, and we'll hopefully hear more about her. And his uh, brother, also uh, well known to many people out there, is Sanjay Gupta, who's the chief medical correspondent for CNN. And Sunil is going to share advice on so many different areas, including how he got his own backing, uh, but also has helped get the backing for organizations like Impossible Foods, Airbnb, 23andMe, SpaceX, and so many more. He's also going to reveal, hopefully we're going to have time to talk about how he got into secrets from Oscar winning films, members of Congress, military leaders, culinary stars, venture capitalists. You know, people, some of the most iconic people, many of the ones we've had here, uh, you've been able to talk to. And so one of the things I think which is really important here is that he talks about how he went from being fearful and afraid of speaking in a room to running for public office. Uh, he also went from being rejected by almost every major investor he pitched all the way to raising millions of dollars from funding from the same investors that backed Google, Uber and Airbnb, Airbnb. And so I'm just excited to have you here, Sunil. So thank you for being here. And maybe to start with, you know, for many of the people, we go back a long way uh, and we'll get into some of those stories uh, of watching this amazing career, career journey that you've been on. But since so much of this is, is with you and your family and so much of your personal story put into this book, I, when you first started, to, I, when I first found out that you were writing this, I was like, what got you there to write this book? Because mm -hmm. like, this is this is hard. Like you put a lot of yourself in here. Yeah, I, I still remember sleeping on your couch, man, when I was when I was coming out to the Bay Area and I was interviewing with companies. Yeah, you know, DJ, I mean, as we know, as I think all of us know, creativity and persuasion are two different things. You can have a great idea. You could be a great candidate for a job. You could have a brilliant product and you can still be dismissed. And we know that that happens all the time. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm fascinated as of late um, with everything that's happening, obviously with the vaccine and thinking about sort of different times in our history when we've needed a vaccine. And there's, there's a story of, of penicillin and a guy named Dr. Alexander Fleming who had invented penicillin in the 1920s 
but it took him 10 years for people to really pay attention to it. And in those 10 years, hundreds of thousands of people ended up passing away from their wounds becoming infected. And so, you know, it, it, you can have the, you can have the right idea. And I certainly have been on the receiving end of this. I've had, you know, dismissed projects, uh, you know, I've been rejected by investors. I've run for political office and I've lost all of this kind of got me interested in this idea of backable people. And the way that I, I like to think about backable people are, are folks who can, who can really get into a room and they, and they really rally us around their ideas or who they are. They, they move us to action. And the trick of it is sometimes they're able to do that, even though what they're sharing may not be 100% obvious, and as is true for, for most new ideas. And I really wanted to understand, like, what is this mysterious it quality that these people seem to have? And, and can it be learned? And it's taken me five years now studying backable people from all different walks of life, from Oscar winning filmmakers to Michelin star chefs to founders of iconic companies. But what I realized is that being backable is not just for celebrities. It's not just for CEOs. No matter what type of change you're trying to create, uh, whether that be in your company, whether that be in your community, uh, wherever it is, even in your family, uh, you 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 kind of need people to believe in you. They need you need need people to see in you what you see in yourselves. That could be a hiring manager, a team, that could be investors, that could be uh, clients, you know, who, whomever it is. And I think that there are a set of qualities that all of us can put into practice to make ourselves more backable. And that's really what this book is about. What were the seven most surprising things that I learned that I didn't know before uh, that we can use to be more compelling inside a room? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe, you know, it's what strikes me is that's so powerful about that is, is this general arc of what is backable, because you think about it from, you know, being a kid and trying to convince somebody to take a shot at you to go to college okay. or to be, uh, uh, how do you propose and be backable to, to a spouse to, to so many of these different, different aspects. So I, I'm curious maybe to start with is when you're exploring this idea of backable, I think a lot of people think of it as just like I'm pitching a startup, right. but you're making a much broader statement about what does it mean for people to buy into you as a, as a, as a, as a human, as a, as a somebody you're going to spend time on. Yeah. 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 Because we all, I mean, we all have, you know, we all have an idea tucked away somewhere and that idea could be you, that, that idea could be, Hey, look, you should take a bet on me with this role or with this project or in a relationship, no, no matter, no matter what it is. And I, and I think that, that there's not a single situation. I don't think a single day goes by really that, that we aren't trying to be backable in, in, in some way, whether that be nurturing something that we want to put out into the world or, you know, you really, really in, in day-to-day -day interactions with the, with the moments that we speak up inside meetings with the conversations that we have with our spouse. It's everywhere. Yeah. Maybe to, to kind of get into start some of the, the, the key lessons, could you start with telling us um, the story of uh, Deonti uh, Higurani, um, who Time Magazine named as a, as a trailblazer, excuse me, it's one of those days, trailblazer. Yeah, yeah. The Mieti Hingarani is is one of my favorite is one of my favorite stories, favorite backable moments because the Mieti grew up, uh, you know, she was a refugee uh, on the border of Pakistan and India, and uh, had this very unlikely dream. And the dream was to become an engineer in America. And her parents got behind the vision. They they saved every penny they had. She eventually got on a boat, a ship to the United States, got a scholarship to Oklahoma State University was the only female in her graduating engineering class. The day after she graduates, she, she drives to, to Detroit, Michigan, where she applies for a job at Ford Motor Company. And this is where it gets really interesting because the hiring manager comes into the room and he looks at her resume and he looks at her application and he says, look, are you applying for the job of an engineer? And she says, yeah. He says, well, you know, I'm sorry. We actually don't have any female engineers working here right now. Because see, this was the 1960s and Ford Motor Company was in its heyday, had thousands of engineers on staff, but not a single one of them was a woman. Crazy. So, you know, deflated, Damienti 
gets up, she picks up her resume, her, her purse, and she begins to walk out of the room. And then in this last ditch moment, she turns around, she looks his hiring manager in the eyes, builds up all the courage she can, and she tells him her story. Of, of all the struggle that it took for her to get to this country, to get to Detroit, to get to this very room. And she says to him, look, if you don't have any female engineers, well, things are changing. So do yourself a favor and hire me now. And it was in this moment that a middle manager from suburban Michigan decides to take a chance on a refugee from the other side of the world. And I love that story, DJ, because, you know, it inspired people and inspired, you know, immigrants that were hoping for a better day. It, it, it inspired women who are in the workforce. Uh, and, and it inspired me because Damianti Hingarani is my mom. It's just amazing. I mean, I, 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 when I first read about her, and I didn't know she was your mom. <laughs> it gave me chills. And I was like, wait, this is your mom. And, and, and uh, you know, growing up in that, that w with such an incredible mother and, and, you know, also just the family environment you had, how, you know, you went to this process, you went to get a JD, but then you also decided to walk away from that mm. a and, you know, to, to kind of say, no, I'm going to go in a different track and then start going down a different direction. Talk to us about those, those decisions and what forced you, and you get into this as one of the important concepts in the book is, is the need to reinvent yourself. Yeah. And, and so could you tell us a little bit about your journey of how you got to this, 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 this portion of getting into the life you have, you've been most recently living? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I guess in my, in my, in my observation, I, I think people tend to sort of live their careers in one of two ways. Well, they either have a map or they have a compass. You know, a map is where you kind of have everything sort of charted out to the destination that you want to get to. And there are plenty of people out there that have that map and they stick to the map and they do very well. You know, I, I certainly go back to my law school reunions and I, and I find people who have sort of stuck to their map and that's, that's what they wanted and, and they've sort of gotten there. But I also find that people sometimes uh, have the map and then they're kind of, they kind of get a few steps in and they realize that that's not quite what they want anymore. And I think sometimes they, 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 they are willing as, as I was to, to sort of trade that map in for a compass where, you know, it's, it's, you, you kind of directionally know where you're going, but you're, but you're really just looking for the next right step. Like, how do I feel right now? And what's the next right move for me in this moment? And it's hard, right? Because, because sometimes you, you, you make decisions in the past and you want to make sure that those decisions in some way have a positive impact on your future. And I think that that's, that's a, that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice quality to have with the career is that you're sort of building. But at the same time, I think we can sometimes get attached where we don't, where we almost have our past determine our future and we get attached to our past. Um, you know, the Buddha had this, had this story that he would tell his disciples, which is that, you know, a man gets to a river and the river is too choppy to swim across. And so he spends months building himself a really robust raft. And then he takes this raft and he crosses the river with the raft. Now, the rest of his journey is going to be by foot. But instead of leaving the raft at the river, he takes this heavy raft, he picks it up over his head, and he carries it the rest of the way. Right? And the, and the, and the lesson is that, look, you know, oftentimes we build a raft because that's the right thing to do in that moment. We need it. But then we get to a different point of our career where all of a sudden that raft isn't needed anymore. And instead of leaving it at the river, we sort of take it and we carry it with us the rest of the way because we're attached to it in some way. And I guess if there's anything, I've tried, I've tried the best I can to kind of let go of the raft when I know it's no longer serving me. Well, let's, let's get into that because I think a lot of people have security in one thing and it's hard to let go because you, you've, you're effectively backable. You're, you're going to have a JD from this great school. And you're gonna be back in that direction, but you, you, and 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 you're, you're I, I, actually, were you, were you married at that point? I, I, you, you, people who don't know, your your wife is also very well known, famous journalist, uh, Lena, 
and uh, cause I remember this story in the book about, which I'd love for you to get talking to. You didn't have a whole lot in the, in, the, <laughs> in the bank account. And you also didn't have, uh, you had a lot of loans. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So Lena, it's funny. I, I don't know if you remember this, but you and David had just been married and, and I, and I was over, I was over at your place and I was talking to you about the idea of proposing to Lena, you know, and, and I was, I was like, you know, I, 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 I you know, I want to, I want to do this. I don't know how, to, how do I do it the right way? And David was sort of giving me advice and um, yeah. So, I mean, I was in, we were in our final year at Northwestern. I was finishing up law school. She was finishing up journalism school. And yeah, I mean, we were in this sort of position where we had, we had student loans, you know, and, and part of it was that, you know, Lena is from the East coast. She had spent sort of most of her life on the East coast. We were in Chicago in that moment, but you know, she had a great life sort of, I think, waiting for her back in New York. And I wanted to go to Silicon Valley. I wanted to, I really wanted to work in tech. And so, you know, you know, Lena, Lena ended up deciding to come to the Bay area kind of in some ways, I think, leave what she had sort of built behind. But what was amazing about, I think, her her part of the journey, and this gets back to the question you were asking as well, DJ, because she had kind of been focused more on politics and business, not as much on tech, but she sort of decided to throw herself into the tech world. So instead of saying, I want to go do business and politics in San Francisco, she was like, look, this is the, this is the hub of tech. Let me like throw myself into that world. And so one of the places that she cold called at that time was a little, like an emerging tech blog called TechCrunch. And she emails, cold calls, Michael Arrington. And she says, Hey, this is, this is my story. I'm here. I'm, I'm willing to, I'm willing to sort of cut my teeth for, for cheap. And you can give me a test run for free. And Mike Arrington's like, sure, I'll, I'll take some free, free, free work. And, and, and that's kind of how it began. She started off as an intern and worked her way up to, to managing editor. It's amazing. And I'd love to come back to this because you've reinvented yourself and, and so she multiple times in, in this way where you've gotten people to back you. And, and I think a lot of times people, you make it look easy. And, and so maybe to kind of get into that a little bit, the thing that I love the most about your book is, is it's not just telling you how to give a pitch. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's so much deeper. It's, it's the process of, uh, of how do you get to an idea that's backable, not just finding an idea. How do you get to an idea of backable? Yeah. And, and that, I think that beginning of it that I loved is this, this concept that you talk about, which is, you know, really, how do you convince yourself first? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would love for you to kind of just talk us through that process and the ideas and this arc of, of what you've learned uh, as but people hopefully will go out there and, and get the book themselves because it's so much more, but maybe you could give us an arc of this process for us. Sure. Yeah. 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 Let's begin there. You know, one, one of the things that I was surprised by was that I, I had, I had assumed that when I was studying backable people that I was going to see a certain style of communication they were going to have a certain way of using eye contact and hand gestures and pacing They'd generally just be sort of classic communication speakers. Um, but I did not find that to be the case at all. I mean, certainly you had people who felt like they came out of a Dale Carnegie or a Toastmasters, but I, I would say the majority did not. And, you know, there, there are plenty of examples of that. And, and if you want one, you can go look up the most popular Ted talk of all time. Uh, the most popular TED talk about over 65 million views. And what you'll find is, is a very unted like presentation. It's a guy named Sir Ken Robinson who gives this brilliant talk on education, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not the mannerisms that you might expect. He's got one hand in his pocket. He sort of meanders on and off script. Um, you know, it, 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 he, he is speaking from the heart, but you know, it's not in the way that we might expect and what I learned over time is that it's not charisma that makes a person convincing. It's conviction. Backable people take the time to convince themselves first. And then they let that conviction shine through whatever style it is that, that, that feels most natural to them. And so, you know, how do you, how do you go about building conviction? And, and in the book, we talk about sort of different techniques that people use. For me, I, I, you know, there, there's a couple of things that I like to keep in mind. One is that, you know, there's always these moments, DJ, when, when, you're, when you're with friends or you're with colleagues and an idea strikes you, right, or inspiration sort of hits. And what we tend to do in those moments is we sort of blurt out the idea. 
But I think we've all kind of been in that moment where we share that idea and we look around, whether that be on Zoom or whether it be in a physical room, and we kind of we kind of realize like no one is quite as excited about the idea as we are, right? And in that moment, it can feel very deflating. You know, one of the things we found with the book is that when we, were, when we were researching how ideas bubble up inside companies, we found that most ideas actually don't get killed inside the formal pitch room. They don't get killed inside conference rooms. They get killed inside hallways. They get killed inside, around water coolers through casual conversations because we blurt out an idea before it's actually ready to be shared. And so what backable people tend to do is they tend to have almost this just really simple decision tree. Do I have high conviction for the idea that I'm about to share or do I have low conviction for the idea I'm about to share? You can almost think of it as like a peanut M&M versus a chocolate M&M, right? Peanut M&M isn't, you know, it's not bulletproof. It's not a piece of metal, but if you squeeze it, it's not going to crack right away. And a chocolate M&M on the other hand, you squeeze it, cracks immediately, right? If it's a peanut M&M, then by all means, like share it. You know, there's no time like the present, but if it's a chocolate M&M, if it's low conviction, backable people tend to resist the temptation to share it in that moment. And they take what we call in the book incubation time. And that incubation time is spent alone with whatever, whatever process works for you. There's some suggestions in the book, but some people like to draw out their ideas. Some people like to talk out their ideas. Some people like to, like me, I like to write out my ideas, but there's a, there's, there's like, Two things, and I'll just really practical things I'll leave you with on this, on this note, which I, I think are very important for this incubation time period. This, one is that it can't be an endless period of time, right? You want to have some kind of end date to it because we all know that like, we can also hang on to our ideas for way too long. And so you want to have some kind of external pressure. Now, if no one's asking you to submit an idea, how do you create some kind of external deadline, some kind of pressure? One of the things you can do is you can call up a friend like you, DJ, I can call you up and say, hey, DJ, three weeks from now, I'd like to share an idea with you. It, can we just mark, can we just put out half an hour on our calendars to do that? And you might ask me in that moment, sure, what's this all about? And I'll say to you, I'm not going to tell you right now. Give me three weeks and, and, and I want to spend some time talking about this. Now it's on my calendar. Right? I, don't have a, I don't have an infinite amount of time, but I have enough time to do this incubation period. The other thing to keep in mind during this incubation period is, to steer into objections, steer into objections. And, and this is something that Reed Hoffman, our, our, our mutual friend, taught me when I was writing the book, which is that oftentimes we get excited about an idea, we'll start writing it out and we'll write out all the things we're excited about it. We'll start building a case for the idea. But it's also very important to at some point take off that excited hat and put on the critic hat and talk about what are the th you know, two to three at least reasons why this doesn't make sense. What are the two to three reasons why someone might flag an objection? And then start to answer those objections proactively yourself. It doesn't have to be bulletproof. If you, if you, had, if you had your perfect answers, it probably wouldn't be a new idea. But just the fact that you can actually have a back and forth, just the fact that you're not scared when someone brings up those objections, you've thought about it yourself, gives you that conviction that we're talking about that you need to have when you go into the room. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us a little bit about your startup? And, yeah. and this, this, the journey that you went through and, and how did this actually map to your, your, your process? Yeah. Well, you know, or were you with a process you wish you had done? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, exactly. So, you know, it, it, I, I find that people write a book because either they have a solution or they have a problem. I, I, I wrote this book because I had a problem. I started to, so what ended up happening, and DJ, I think, knows most of the story, but for those of you watching who, who may not, you know, I, 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 I had gone through a string of failures. I get a phone call one day from the organizers of a conference called FailCon, which stands for Failure Conference. And it's always a humbling experience when somebody calls you and says, hey, you know, we're doing this conference on failure, and we would love for you to be the keynote speaker. I decided to do it. And I didn't realize this at the time, but, but a reporter from the New York Times is in the audience. And so fast forward to, I'm sitting in my apartment in San Francisco, and that day's New York Times is a full-length article on failure with my face at the top. Now, this is right around the time, it was 2013, and this is right around the time that failure was starting to become a topic that we were, we were starting to talk about more. And so that article went viral, and you know, literally at that time, you could have Googled failure 
and my face would have been one of your top search results. So at the time I was raising money for a company called Rise, which was my startup. And it, and it was one-on-one nutrition coaching right over your mobile phone. So you join, you join, you give us your health goals. We match you with a nutritionist that we think makes sense for you. Um, and you work with this person on a daily basis to get yourself into, into the best physical condition that you can be in. And, uh, and I was having a very, very tough time fundraising for this. I had pitched over a dozen investors and every single one of them had said no. And so one of the things that I did was I decided to use this article as an icebreaker to start having these conversations about how do you actually become backable. And so what I would do is I would email people and I would say, you know, clearly, as you can see from this article, I don't know what I'm doing, but would you be willing to spend a few minutes with me over the phone or grab coffee um, and give me some advice? And it really worked. Like a lot of people responded that I have never had a higher hit rate on cold call emails than that one. Then, you know, uh, maybe it was maybe it was a mix of things. Maybe it made people laugh. Maybe it was it was just being open and honest. And and the 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 best part of it was that it wasn't just open and honest. It was that people were actually sharing. They were actually sharing. You know, a much more I think candid view on what you know what had actually happened in their career. And it kind of made me realize something, which is that oftentimes when we look at people that we admire, we kind of assume that their current state was the way it always has been. But those candid, open, honest conversations sort of gave me the view that like, wow, there's been a heck of a lot of failure and a lot of mistakes and a lot of setbacks in those careers as well. So what can I learn from those? And those conversations really ended up becoming the underpinnings of, of this book. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating because I think people think that it's just, you're just naturally backable. Then, then actually you can learn this process. Yeah. And so maybe, could you tell, you know, there's so many great, and uh, you know, stories in the book from just different walks of life. Could you talk to us about one where, you know, I think somebody was just surprised at how they were able to pivot into becoming backable or the, 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 the shift that the paradigm shift that's really required to, to get this to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, there's, there's what I, what I like about, I think the, the format of the book is that, is that there are these sort of these, these high level qualities, but then there are these techniques that I think really, I think you can put into practice immediately. And when, and when I, when I arrived on these techniques, I thought to myself, wow, like, why haven't I been doing this all along? And I would literally go into my next pitch meeting and I would do it and it would, and it would work. So, you know, one, you know, one thing that, I, I found really interesting is when I went to go, I, I would sit in on pitch meetings. It was a big part of my process. I'd sit in, I would just watch founders pitch investors. And one of the pitch meetings I sat in on was, it was a, was a, was the owner of a pizza shop outside of Brooklyn in New York. And he was pitching a bunch of, you know, New York based VCs. And so he had come into like the city and he, he was now, he was now, you know, ready for this meeting. And I showed, I showed up a few minutes early and so, you know, this is pre pandemic. So we're all meeting in person and, you know, the, just DJ, like just the, be, like the most charming guy. Right. And just really, it's always like fun when you see somebody who's lit up by what they do, like truly lit up. Then you could, it was clear this guy, this guy was, he was a fourth generation pizza shop owner and he was showing me photos, of his great grandfather and the pizza shop that they had back in Italy. And it's just really, it was, it was, it was a, it was a great story. But as, as the investor started to walk into the room, you could see his demeanor begin to shift. You could see him start to become, I think, the person that he expected, that he, he thought they expected him to be, right? And as he started, he put his slides up on, on the projector and he started to kind of walk through things, you know, that, that energy that I'd saw before really kind of dissipated. But you were asking about the shift moment, and, and, and I thought this was really interesting, which is that about halfway through the pitch, he wanted to show us the app that he was creating on his phone, which was basically push a button, get a pizza delivered from an independent pizza place, so not a Domino's, not a Little Caesars, but like an ind independent. And he didn't have slides on that, so he had it on his phone. And so we ended up getting up out of our seats, walking over to him, and we're all now sort of looking over his shoulder as he's showing us on his phone this app. And that's when the energy 
started to come back. Right. And, and, and I started to realize this pattern over, 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 over and over again, which is that we are much more, I think much better, much more compelling when we're showing something rather than just simply describing it. Right. Like it, 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 when we, when we kind of shift in some ways, the spotlight that's inevitably on us, we're able to take that spotlight and shift it onto something else shifted onto our product, shifted onto our customer. What that does is that shifts us from presentation mode into huddle mode, where we're now looking at something together. And I, and I think that that became very important to him. I think it becomes very important, especially when someone on the other side of the table looks different than you or thinks differently than you to kind of bring you two into alignment, to shift into this huddle mode it becomes very important. You, you have this uh, portion in the book where you talk about flipping, if I get this right, is flipping outsiders into insiders. Yeah. And, and um, I think it's one of those things that's like, yeah, I need to do that. And that's one of those things of like, how do I do that? Because <laughs> sometimes the people on the other side are really intimidating. Yeah. 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 No, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, one of, one of my favorite stories from the book is a classic story is, is Betty Crocker introduces instant cake mix to the market. And this is the 1940s. And they're, they're so confident that instant cake mix is going to sell well because it's so easy. All you have to do is pour water into a mix, pop it into the oven, and voila, you get this really tasty treat. Like who wouldn't, who wouldn't want that? And so they're really, really surprised when they find out that instant cake mix is not selling. People aren't buying it. And they're trying to figure out why, and they can't. So they hired this psychologist named Ernest Dekta to go out into the field and start interviewing homes around the United States. And what Dyke comes back with was really fascinating. He said, I think that you have made the process of making a cake too easy, too simple. You have basically removed the customer from the creative process. So what Dyke recommended is why don't you remove one ingredient and just see what happens. And so they do, they remove the egg. So now as a customer, you have to buy and crack and mix in your own fresh egg and sales completely take off because now customers really feel like they are part of this creative process. When the cake came out of the oven, they felt like it was their cake, you know, and researchers have unpacked this over and over again. Uh, recently, there was, you know, more recently, there was a study where they, a group of economists called this the Ikea effect, where, you know, we place up to five times the amount of value on something that we build than something that we simply buy off the shelf. So what does this have any to do with, with creativity and innovation and getting people on your side? Well, I, I think we've, we've been told that creativity is this two-step formula where you come up with a great idea and you execute on it really well, but there is this hidden step in between. And the hidden step is where you, you take these you know, early employees, early colleagues, people who have to take a flyer on what it is you're doing, but the reason they take that flyer is because they feel like that idea is theirs as well. They feel like they feel ownership of it. They feel like they were able to crack their own egg into the mix. And, and I think you can trace not just every startup back to this hidden step, but I think every successful movement, I think every successful political organization, every society in a lot of ways, back to, back to this hidden step where people felt like they were owners of it as well. How, how do you do that when you're giving a presentation and it's more formal? Yeah. How, how do you flip people? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, I think, I think one of the, one of the secrets I think to, you know, I think a successful sort of meeting is, is, a, is that you're not coming in with a fully baked pitch, which, which I know, I know that sounds a little bit counterintuitive because we, we want to feel like we have everything figured out before we come into the room. And by the way, you should have thought through everything before coming into the room. And, there, and there's a difference, though, between having thought through things and feeling like you know all of the answers. There, there is a difference between sharing what something could be versus sharing how it has to be. And, and I think that there's something very intoxicating to be able to walk into a room to say, look, we have about, we have a lot of things figured out, but as it turns out, the things that we don't have figured out are the things that you know, really, really well, right? Like DJ, I'm sure, for example, you probably get 
you get, you get pitched all the time to be advisors of, of different companies. Right. And, 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 you know, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to assume, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this, but like when they come to you, you know, coming to you with a reason, not as to like, Hey, we just need like a, a roster of great sounding people on our team, but coming to you with some you know, reason as to why you DJ with your experience, having done the things that you've done actually fit what it is that we need fit in some ways, what our gaps are. I, 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 I'd be anxious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a great highlight. Um, because I think it's, it's that, that process when somebody comes, you know, it's that natural one is when somebody's on the other side of the table with you and you, or you're going for a walk and you're problem solving together. And, and they're saying like, look, I'm coming to you maybe because I want X, but I also need Y. Yeah. And you have this unique value proposition. And I actually, even if you don't support me on this idea, your wisdom or your advice from this meeting is going to dramatically make me better. Yeah. And, and I think that the best rejections are the ones that you've learned something unique and you're like, Oh, and, and you actually talk about this later on is like, you went back to some of the people who rejected you. Yeah. 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 I, I, I did. That. And I, and I love that too. The, the idea of being able to like be in problem solving mode together, those tend to create these, these backable moments and you can't be in problem solving mode. If you're walking in believing and trying to show that you have all the answers, having some gaps that you're sort of problem solving with, with the person on the opposite side of the table or the person you're walking with, I think is, is critically important. I, I, I want to get to the, the sort of going back to people but it was really interesting. One of my favorite conversations from the book was with the president of the MacArthur Genius, the MacArthur Foundation, which runs the Genius Grant. And they, you know, and it's a it's a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar grant, um, highly highly competitive. Is got you know Lin Manuel Miranda, the creator of Hamilton, is a, is a MacArthur Genius Award recipient. And one of the things that he told me that was really surprising is that if you're if you're somebody they're considering for the grant, and you are already on a very clear path to success that will actually make you a weaker candidate for the grant. Not a stronger candidate, but a weaker candidate. Now, I asked him why. why, why would that be? And he, and he said, well, because we want to know that we made some kind of difference. We want to know that you have potential, but that it was because of us, because of what we were able to contribute, invest in, that we were able to sort of put you on, a, on, on the path and help you get there. And, and, you know, he was, he was talking to me from the perspective of, 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 the, of the foundation, but he also said, look, I think that, you know, most human beings are this way, right? At the end of the day, you know, when I talk to my students, when I talk to people that I'm coaching, and I'm sure you find this as well, it's just like one of the, one of the main things that we want to do is we want to have impact, right? We want to know that we made some kind of difference in the world. And, and you know, when we just tell this, what, I, what I call just the story of me, when we walk into a room and we tell the story of my idea, the story of my resume, we miss the opportunity to talk about the story of us, which is how does my story and your story sort of fit together to tell this story of us? Mm -hmm. and one of the clearest ways to do that, getting back to your question, is by, is by going back to people even who have said no to you. So one of the things that I, I made a mistake of doing when I was pitching my company is I would get rejected by investors and I would never ask them why. <laughs> I never say why, 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 you know, I take their sort of their note and, you know, usually their emails or something like, Hey, you know, um, it's like a college rejection. You just got the envelope, yeah. but you never actually went back and said, what, what, what was the dimension on which I got dinged on? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and, and so, and so I'm sitting with a friend one day and I'm venting to him and I'm telling him like, I, I just don't know. Like, I, I don't, I don't, this idea doesn't seem to be working. Investors don't seem to be glomming onto it. And he said, well, why? why, why aren't they, why aren't they interested in it? And I said, well, because it's not, it doesn't fit their model or they don't see the potential. And he's like, but, but why don't they see the potential? And it, and it became clear to me that I didn't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I went back to, to the investors that rejected me and I sent them an email that said something like, you know, Hey, I'm not trying to convince you to change your mind. Just let me say that up front, but I would love your feedback. If you'd be interested in spending like just five minutes with me on the phone, I'd love to know a little bit more uh, about, you know, what would it have taken just hypothetically? And, you know, most of them said, sure, I'll jump on the phone with you and I'll give you feedback. And the interesting thing is at that time, we were very early and I thought the biggest problem was that we just didn't have enough customers. 
What I heard during those conversations, though, was something different. It didn't have to do with the number of customers. What they were concerned with was whether customers would stick around. Because what we were doing is we were helping people get into great physical shape. But once you actually reach your goal, what's your incentive to be there anymore? You know? And so their concern was that our churn rate was going to be way too high. Makes a lot of sense, but not something that I was thinking about as their primary concern. The reason that mattered is because I was bankrolling this out of, out of pocket. I couldn't do this indefinitely. I had a few months of runway left, tops. I needed to spend my time thinking about one problem. I couldn't solve a bunch of problems. I could solve maybe one. I would have gone out and tried to get more customers on board had I not had those conversations. But because I had those conversations, I decided to focus on retention. I started running experiments, doing cohort analyses, and I came back. What, what, what I decided to do after we started to get some traction on the retention side and show that people would stick around through a maintenance program, I went back to all those investors who gave me that piece of advice. And I said, hey, again, not trying to change your mind, but I would love to share with you what you, what you inspired us to do, like how, how our conversation has impacted our business. Two of the investors who had said no switched their answer to a yes as a result of those conversations. No, oh, it's, it's just so powerful like that, that not walking away. And, and we're uh, for those out there, it's, we've gotten a number of really good questions. Please keep sending your questions. We're going to switch to question mode in just a minute here, but maybe before we just go to so, the, the first set of questions, you know, we are living in a time where we have phenomenal people who should be backable and don't get opportunity. And I would love your, your perspective if you've, if you've gone on this journey of how do we make sure that those minorities, women, other, other, so many groups that deserve a shot become backable? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's such, a, it's such an important question. I think we, should, we could, have, could have a full, we should and could have a full conversation about just this. You know, less than 5% of venture capital funding goes to female founders right now, less than 1%. To black female founders, I mean, it, it's a. I think it's a huge, huge societal problem, and I wish I could tell you that somewhere in my research, I found a, a gem or an insight that would solve that because nothing would make me happier. I, I think about you know, I think about my my mom, you know, and 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 all the people in my life who I think have been on the receiving end of this, and you know, haven't gotten the backing that they needed simply because they didn't look the part, um, and. You know, I think this book can be helpful in terms of techniques, I think, for anybody. But I think in particular, when the person on the other side of the room does not look like you. you know, one of the people that I, that I started to coach when I was writing this book was, was, was someone who you, you would feel like, in, by all respects, would be a backable person, right? Like she, 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 was, she was part of the Israeli army just a, just a badass like marketing executive. But whenever she would walk into rooms, especially with the management, with the other man, you know, up, other senior management or a company, she could not, she could not present in a way that would get her ideas across. And so she came to me and said, look, when, when that kind of, when I'm in that situation, I sort of collapse, you know, I, I, I get so nervous that I literally sweat through my clothes. And I thought to myself, how does this happen for somebody who has such an incredible background? Right. And one of the things that we arrived on, and I'll just share with this with you, knowing that this is very technique based and we're talking about a societal problem, but this is a very technique. One technique that I think really helped her, which I'll just share with you, is that to become an agent for the person that you are trying to serve, become an agent for the person you are trying to serve. And what I mean by that is if you look at, if you look at um, you know, agents inside places like Creative Artists Agency, well, one thing that I found that was really interesting is that when they were in the room representing their clients, they took on a, they took on a much more confident demeanor than when they were in the room representing themselves. So when they were trying to go out and go in and ask for a raise for themselves, not as confident, but going in and the table pounding for on behalf of somebody else, much higher confidence. And so we decided to start playing with that with, with just non-agency scenarios. What would it look like is if you as a founder always felt when you were walking to a room with an investor or a board, or if you as somebody inside a company and you were walking in to give a pitch or a presentation to your team, you always felt like you were being an agent for someone else. 
I'm not representing me. I'm representing that person, whoever that person might be just really having a clear image of that, of, of that. I think that that can help in some ways to, I think, get outside of our head in the right way, which I think, again, it can be very easy to be inside our head, especially when we have the amount of bias that we know exists in the system right now. Hmm. It's such a, it's such a good point. And, and uh, something I think we see, uh, we've all experienced it ourselves, which is that, that moment. And actually this gets to one of the questions here is, is what's the moment that turned you around from being hesitant to putting yourself out there? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the, the mentality that I, I think I used to have was, it was almost sort of this, 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 you have one shot to make it work. You have one shot to do a startup. If it doesn't work, you're done, right? You have one shot to go run for political office. You lose, you're done, right? I, I sort of had that kind of mentality and it was really through the conversations that I started to have after I, after that New York times article came out, where again, I began to realize that you know, the version of, of the person that we see today wasn't necessarily the version, wasn't the chapter one version. The chapter, the chapter one version was very different. And by the way, between chapter one and chapter 15, there are all sorts of setbacks or all sorts of mistakes. You know, I think one of the things that I, one of the mantras that I like to give myself that I kind of, that kind of emerged from this book is that long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment long-term success comes from short-term embarrassment. And, and I guess the shift you know, came from, I guess, just the willingness to be okay with embarrassing myself, knowing that it's not all waste. Like that embarrassment came with learning every single, every, every single embarrassment I've had has been in some ways, a stepping stone, a learning and insight that I've been able to take with me. Um, and, and, and that, and that, that sort of, that sort of has taken me away from the kind of one, you have one shot because that's just, it's simply, it's simply not true. It's, it's a great reminder. There's, there's a part in the book that you also talk about, which is from our, our friend Reed Hoffman, you know, you know, if you, if you're not embarrassed by the first time you show somebody something, you haven't done it right. And, and there's, right. there's a version of that, 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 that strikes me also is like people, people seem to focus on that. The, the failures are going to be the lasting legacy and people yeah. don't, don't forget that, you know, I had a $41 million startup failure of a photo sharing app that was it's just it was just almost retrospectively and still is uh, embarrassing it, uh, and part of it is is that you don't show people the ideas early enough or get enough input f f uh, on things early and and i'm curious and this kind of gets to another question is how do you find your people hmm Hmm. Well, first of all, it's funny. You had to remind me about the $41 million photo sharing app because I, I completely forgot. Well, when about you that. say it, it hurts more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think I, hadn't, I, I completely forgot about that. And, that, and, that's, and that's, just the, that's just the thing. I, people is really, really important. I, I, I found that backable people tend to really surround themselves with a circle of people, a circle of trusted people. I'll tell you this really quickly, DJ, because I know you and I really, really uh, you know, love talking about policy and how, how politics works in different countries. I, I took a trip to Bhutan a few years ago that changed my life. And, and part of the reason I got really fascinated by Bhutan is because they, they measure themselves not based on gross domestic product, the way that I think most countries do. They measure themselves based on gross national happiness. And it's a metric that that accounts for economic growth, but but it's not the only thing. It rolls up into something sort of much bigger. And when I was out there, I, I just it's 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 been it's been a metric they've used for over five decades now. And, and and so I got a chance to spend some time with the team that collects the research. And I asked them, Hey, is there like one question when you're when you're out there really trying to get a sense of someone's happiness? Is there one question that you can ask that could be a really good indicator for you? And they said, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. And the question is, if you were in trouble right now, who could you call and know with 100% certainty that person would be there for you? And they believe that, that, that having an answer to that question, there's people who have an answer to that question, are much more likely to be happy. But there's a, there was a twist. And the twist was, whose list are you on? Mm -hmm. Who can call you? and know with 100% certainty that you will be there for them. And you know that they know that. That's just as important. 
So it's not, it's not a line. It's a circle. It's a circle that you're creating. And, and, and I believe that that's true, not just in, in life, but, but it, it certainly has been true in terms of these backable people that I, w- I was studying, which is that they seem to surround themselves with a circle of people and they were part of the circle as well. And I got so interested in like these different circles that people were surrounding themselves with that I want to understand, like, were there personalities, certain types of people that are critical to a backable circle. And as it turns out, there, there were, there were four different types of personalities that emerged for a backable circle. People who are gonna be people you go to with new ideas or thinking about career changes, bouncing new, bouncing new concepts off of. And I call them the four C's. So the first C is your collaborator your collaborator. And this is someone who, when you're with them, you, you kind of almost feel like you're in a musical jam session with them. They're using words like, yes, and they're building on top of your ideas. You're riffing with each other. That's your collaborator. The second is your coach. And your coach is different than your collaborator because while your collaborator is really thinking about whether your idea is, is good for the market or good for the company, does it, is it intellectually, does it make sense? Your coach is really thinking about, does this idea work for you? Like, is this something that you're going to want to go do? Like Lena, my wife is my coach and I come to her with ideas all the time and she's able to think like a collaborator, but, but more importantly to me, she's able to say, look, that's a good idea for someone else. You're not going to want to spend the next five years really focusing on that. I just know you and you need, you need a coach to be able to give you that personal look. The third is your cheerleader and your cheerleader. It might sound cheesy, but we all need someone who like, no matter what you can call them and know you can get that last bit of juice before you walk into the meeting. Like DJ and I have a common friend, Ellen Levy, who fast company magazine named the most connected woman in Silicon Valley, like crazy network, you know, fortune 500 executives, members of Congress in her Rolodex. But I asked her like, who do you call before you walk into a big meeting? And she's like, that's easy. I call my mom. My mom is the person I call before I walk into a meeting. And the fourth is, I think, the, 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 the least appreciated, but I, potentially the most important C, which is your critic. But I like to call this person your cheddar. And the reason I call this person your cheddar is because if you've ever watched the movie Eight Mile, Eminem is surrounded by a circle of friends, and they're all kind of building him up through the movie. But there's one friend named Cheddar who's constantly kind of poking holes in his ideas. But what we find through the movie is that it's really cheddar that gets Eminem ready for the stage, gets him ready to win. And I bring this up because we all kind of have a cheddar in our lives and 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 that person can be kind of annoying. (laughs) You know, who wants, who wants their ideas to have holes poked in them. But as it turns out, just like it was for Eminem, it's the cheddar that really gets us ready for these backable moments. They're the, they're the people who I think care about us. They, they want to see us win, but they're also not afraid to point out our blind spots. Those are the four C's. Yeah. It's amazing you say it because I think something that we're both very fortunate of is our spouses. They, they can tell when we're lit up by an idea yeah. or we're just sort of like the dimmers at five versus to 10 in, oh. in our excitement. And is that the problem that we should be going after? The, the direction I, I, uh, that I want to this, you actually nailed a bunch of the questions. We did not plan this out because these questions are coming live. So you've answered a few of those. One of the ones that, that it is thematic through a number of the questions here is the role of honesty, authenticity, and charlatans. Mm-hmm. And the difference between people who are selling an idea just in, you know, hucksters. And we've seen this fraud and, you know, the, the, the Madoff kind of pyramid schemes and, and these type of things. Yeah. Uh, George Schultz, as one of the people pointed out, is said, is, you know, that trust is a coin of the realm. And and uh, how how do you think about those concepts and also make sure that when you're taking and investing time in others, you're not being spun a line. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's such an important, I think, I think concept because uh, over and over again, as I was writing the book, I started to find these people who uh, that, that have not necessarily been a benefit, have been detractors in a lot of ways, I think from the overall common good that I think arguably could be called backable, backable people. You know, I, I, you, you take Billy McFarland, uh, you know, from the Fire Festival, just as an example, you know, and, and, and you know, McFarland, 
he did not have an entrepreneurial track record to point to. Um, he was relatively, he was relatively young. Uh, the, the, the startup that he had worked on before that had not done well. And yet he was able to convince, you know, highly, highly reputable investors to give him over $26 million in funding for the festival for, for a pretty half-baked idea, um, which, you know, turned out to be a fraud. And, you know, you compare a story like that to just say somebody like Bob Ebeling, which if that name doesn't sound familiar, Bob Ebeling was an engineer in the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger launch. And Ebeling was a whistleblower. He, he basically knew, he had looked at the data, and he knew that something bad was going to happen if that thing went up in the air. And so he did what I think, you know, I think a lot of us would do. He called a meeting, got his team into a room, shared the data, and was dismissed. They decided to launch anyway, and within 90 seconds, the Space Shuttle Challenger disintegrated, killing everybody on board. Bob Ebeling ended up blaming himself for that for the rest of his life. NPR did an interview with him shortly before he died, and he said, look, God should not have chosen me for that role because I had all of the information, I had all of the data, but I was not able to convince them. I was not able to change their mind. And so I, I, do, I do think that it's a really, I think it's a really important question and something for all of us to keep our eye on, which is that just because somebody is backable doesn't necessarily mean they're coming from the right place. I wrote this book because I think that we need more high integrity people who know how to who know how to sell an idea, you know. In terms of the flip side of it, one of the things that I think, as backers, as people who are who are, who are evaluating ideas, I think it sometimes do a better job of, is that when we we can we can actually try to remove some of the salesmanship from the process. Like one thing I think has been kind of interesting during the pandemic is that you're seeing companies shift a little bit from brainstorming where the loudest voice in the, in the room tends to drown out everybody else to brain writing where teams are now submitting ideas through more written formats and ideas are being evaluated more for what they were, what they really are. And they can come from some of the quieter voices in the room, some of the underrepresented voices in the room. I think that's a really positive shift that we may want to consider having stick even post pandemic. But the other thing that I saw really work, and this was, this was something that, that, that the people closest to Bill Gates would share with me, is that he likes to remove salesmanship from the process by using precision questioning. So typically, if, if, we're, in a, if we're in a one hour pitch, we're going to go through some of the, the, you know, the, the high level points of, of your idea. We're going to talk about distribution. We're going to talk about supply. We're going to talk about team building, all the sort of the high levels of finances. Um, what, what Bill Gates likes to do is he likes to spend a few minutes on the high level, but then pick one, pick one area and go really, really narrow and deep on one area, knowing that he can always do a follow-up meeting on all the other stuff. But the reason that he goes narrow and deep is he really wants to understand like, what's the substance underneath? Like, let me start to remove away the sales layers. Let me start to, let me start to ask why enough times where now we're actually having like a really, really deep conversation about one thing. And I've only got, you know, a half hour to an hour. So instead of trying to do that across all the, all the topics, I'm going to pick one and go really, really narrow and deep. I like that. Like, I think that we, at least in terms of a first meeting, need to be doing more of that rather than staying like broad and shallow the entire time. Yeah, it's, it, there's another great set of stories in the book about talking about Hollywood producers and the story of how the Titanic got funded yeah. and, and also how, you know, people can just say that's the worst idea ever. Uh, uh, and, and getting it, how, how to using that as a jarring function to see somebody's response to yeah. test if it, is it, is it, is there, is there, is it real, yeah. you know, we're not going to have time to go into that. So people are going to have to read about that to, to get into the, the, that, you know, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about aspects of today. There's a number of questions on this of, of it, that are both on the political realm of what makes a politician backable in 2021, you ran for office uh, and people are asking this is the, the question, which you can break the news here if you like, uh, or would you try to run again? <laughs> I, I, I won't be breaking any news. I mean, I, I think my wife, I think my wife might actually be watching this. And as she, as we both know now, running for office is, is very much a family decision. So, so, you know, we'll, we'll be making, we'll be making it as a family. 
But you know, it's interesting about what makes a what makes someone backable, like as a as a politician. And and I and I, I I think I need to do more digging into this topic because it's I think it's changing. And and the reason that I think it's changing is because I think we're finding you know I think a, a, a like a couple things to be true. Number one is that you can you can reinvent yourself along the way, right? What you the way that you run one campaign doesn't need to be the way that you run another campaign. You learn so much and you can reinvent yourself and you can become someone you can become someone new. You know, like my first exposure to politics was in 2004 when I was working for the Democratic National Committee and I was backstage and in Boston for the convention that year. Um, and, you know, Democratic Convention, and it's all the classic sort of names. But there was one person that no one really knew, no one recognized. And it was a state senator from Illinois. Right. And so Barack Obama gets up on stage and he gives his speech. And of course, like that night ended up changing his life. And I think the trajectory of I think of a lot of our politics just in one speech. But I wanted to understand, like, where did the story really begin? And what I was surprised by is that, you know, a lot of you may know this. He ran for Congress four years prior to that. And he lost and he lost by a two to one margin. So significant. He significant, got crushed. He got crushed. <laughs> he got crushed. Here was the thing that was even more surprising to me. The way that he was received. People described him. If you look at the press articles, people described him as stilted, as professorial, as uninspiring. There was a there was a there was a journalist named Ted McClelland who followed him throughout the entire campaign who said Barack Obama is so dry that he sucks up all the air out of the room. And then four years later, he's this like bastion of energy and hope and inspiration for, for millions of young people, including me. And, and so I guess this, this, this notion of being able to reinvent yourself and, and what sort of happens along the way, as it turns out, when we talk about, it, talk about him in the book, there was a lot that he did in terms of surrounding himself with the circle of people and playing what I call in the book, exhibition matches. And exhibition matches are low stakes practice sessions before you get into a high stakes venue. And it's really these practice sessions that I think are, are we don't see, we don't see how sloppy they really are. So when they get into the room, we're like, wow, that person's a really gifted speaker. That, that person must naturally be great at that. And what we find as we dig into story after story is that actually, no, they're, they're the product of lots and lots of practice. Mm-hmm. It's amazing because, he, and you talk about this also, this, this, um, what uh, you refer to as a rule of 21, but also like, you know, what I can share is, you know, if you see how much president Obama prepared for the state of the union address, you just think, oh, he's just a naturally great speaker and he, he's gifted, but the amount of work people put in yeah. to, to test the ideas, refine them, have people who are their cheddar also to, to, to really figure out like, where's that, those flaws. Yeah. When, when you look at those kind of aspects, what do you think? And, and if you could just go quickly, cause we have a couple more of these yeah. is, is what, what is it that we need to do to create backable ideas for us as a society, given how polarized we are? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm coming to you right now from outside of Detroit, Michigan, and I think, you know, we, we need to, we need to cast a wider net. We need to cast a wider net. I mean, I, I think there's, there's a hotbed, I think of innovative ideas. I and mean, if you, you just, just take one, just take healthcare, for example, you take a lot of the sort of, you know, vaccines that we've had up until now, you take a lot of the medical technology, a lot of that came from the Midwest and the South. And, and, you know, we just, these are regions where you have a, a tremendous amount of talent that just don't get the, the airtime, uh, the, the, the viewpoint still to this day, which, which, you know, I'm, I'm working to help change is that you need to leave Michigan in order to have a voice. You need to leave Michigan. You need to go to California. You need to go to New York in order to have a platform. And, and, you know, I think in terms of bubbling up the best ideas and giving people opportunity, no matter where they are, no matter what zip code they live in is about casting a wider net, you know, DJ, this is a plug for you to take a trip to Detroit. Come, come see me as soon as we're, you know, vaccinations and we're, we're, it's all safe to come see like the exciting things that are happening here. It's true. I mean, Detroit, the Midwest, having spent many of my summers in Columbus, Ohio, this phenomenal innovation that people have, have missed. You know, in the last uh, uh, minute here, uh, there's a lot of students, younger generation people who are watching. What's your advice to them? 
Oh gosh. You know, I have two daughters. Uh, I have a, I have an eight year old and a four year old and we, we have a little routine that we do every, every morning. I ask them two questions. I ask them, what is the meaning of life? And they say to me to find your gift. And then I ask, okay, well then is, what is the purpose of life? And they say to give it away. And it's based on this quote from Picasso, which is, you know, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And backable is really just about how do we, how do we give our gift away? Like, how do we take this thing that's inside of us and make sure that we don't, you know, have unused creativity that at the end of the day, we were able to share that with the world. And I think that there are three words that I have found more than anything that tend to hold us back from doing that, which is I'm not ready. I'm not ready to share that idea. I'm not ready to um, run with something new. I'm not ready to speak my mind. But the thing, if I could leave you with one thing, it's this. I've now studied hundreds of extraordinary people and really peeled the layers back in their career. And what I've realized is that none of them were really ready. Like three friends from design school were not ready to start Airbnb. A mid-level talent manager was not ready to start SoulCycle. A 15-year-old from Stockholm, Sweden, was not ready to build an environmental movement, but today Greta Thunberg is Time Magazine's youngest person of the year. And yeah, there were failures and there were setbacks and there were mistakes along the way, but I think that they all tended to adopt a mantra, which is that the opposite of success is not failure, it's boredom. Mm -hmm. So let's run with the ideas that make us come alive and let's inspire good people to join us along the way. Yeah, I love that. And, and maybe just to end on that note, I love your your example of the question from Bhutan about like, whose list are you on to be that that first call? And it's a, that's just model of create more than you can take. I think it's just so inspiring. You know, I, I just want to just say again for everyone out there and, and um, my thanks and our thanks to Sunil Gupta, entrepreneur, author of the new book, Backable, The Surprising Truth Behind What Makes People Take a Chance on You. It's available in your local bookstore and online. You can follow him on Twitter at Sunil, follow him on LinkedIn. There's so many great things. And most of all, I just want to thank all our viewers. Thank all of you that are joining. Thank all of you that have donated. Please stay safe. Take care of each other. And I'm DJ Patil. And now this program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.